one or the other of these comes out this way, right? Eh, got them backwards. Sorry. But it makes it into a 3D problem. So just look. They did not give you a sign convention. It's all up to you. As my good, now passed away friend and mentor, Riley, of your book, said, the parts don't come with an X, Y, Z axis stamped on them. So, you're free, you know. I like X going that way. Just do. I like Y going that way. I like Z going that way. That's not what the book does. They always have this X coming out for me. Why don't I want X coming out for me? Me, I'm one that looks from the side all the time, you know, so I want to see X going to the right. But you can do whatever you want. You want to call them PQR. Who cares? Right? Don't do that, though. Okay. Now, enough said about homework. Is that helpful? Okay, and we're, you're going to see this type of problem come back at you because we're going to use that, this kind of information then to figure out what the stress is, what's happening inside of the metal. So we can pick the size of the uh, shafts. Or if we have a shaft, find out if it's going to break or not. Okay, so th this part is really, really, really worthwhile. And I'll repeat, if you give me what I consider not worth grading, you get it back and you have to do it over. I want some professionalism in this, in that respect. So it's a lot different. You know, a lot different than the fact that well, I handed that in and I got a seven. <laughs> okay, I got a seven. You may get it back and maybe you did seven more, but I thought you missed something that was really important. You're going to do it all over again. So, sometimes it's easier to do it right the first time. But it's going to take some getting used to, because this is not normal. But then I don't claim to be such. Okay. Now, just a quick intro then to uh, what are stresses. Don't, don't worry about what it reads in here. I'm back to this arm, if you will, this this uh, two-force member where I've got load P and load P here. And you see, even in the real picture, you'll see that it is not a constant cross-section. Now, it's strange to me, to be honest, because this makes no sense. And as we go along, You'll see why this is the most stressed area, and this will be the least stressed area. So they got the most area where they have the least amount of stress. I have no idea why. This makes no sense. Just make it, if this is good down here, as you will find out as we go along, just make it straight. If it's okay down here, it's going to have to work. We have to do special things down there, but if it's going to fail, it's going to fail there, more than likely. Well, with this, it definitely will. So what we do is say, well, you know, that force is resisted by that metal. And how do we think about how that force is, is resisted? So we take out a little, if you will, a little layer in there and say, well, you know, that force is acting on that layer. And how is it reacting? Well, it's reacting such that this whole surface here on the top, we're assuming that that load is distributed completely across that section, like a pressure. But it's a tension pressure, if you will, which we're going to call stress. All right? You change the area, if you get a really small area, as you see, then that, you know, you know, the gut feel says, I got more stress. Right? I increase the load, I got more stress. Because if I got a fixed area, I increase the load, that load's got to be distributed over that same area. So what's logical? And we're going to come at this a couple different ways. Uh, 
What's logical to me is there. We have a uniform pressure or stress from a uniaxial load. Got a load only going in one axis. I don't have one going in this direction. I don't have any going in this direction. I don't have any mo. It's just one load. Okay, it's really important. And it's W by T, so what we've got here is, is that the stress is equal to that force P by, divided by the cross-sectional area. Uh, it's that simple. Let's look at some units. Uh, we got pounds per inch squared, which is PSI, as you see here. Uh, 1,000... PSI is equal to 1 KSI, where K is 1,000. It's not common practice, or acceptable. I don't know if you call it acceptable. But a, a million PSI is not 1 MSI, although I've seen it. But we don't use that here. It would be nice if we did. But it's not common practice, so... But you get into a company, if that's what they do, that's what they do. Okay, in SI units, it's uh, the, the units of pressure are, well, like newtons per meter squared. And that's a Pascal. So you got kilopascals. Here we do have megapascals, 10 to the 6th. And we are going to have, believe it or not, gigapascals, 10 to the 9th. They're going to be popping up. Right. Um, so just as a very quick illustration here, we've got an I-beam, and, and uh, the area that we're going to use is then just the area, that whole cross-sectional area. And we have tables, and it gives you the, uh, in the back of your book, it gives you the cross-sectional area. So if the the load is 20,000 pounds and, you, and it's got 5 square inches, then you got 4,000 psi, which is 4 ksi. Any more difficult than that? Okay. So, I, I do show one other thing, and it's just so you don't get hung up. 20,000 pounds is the same as 20 kips. A kip is 1,000 pounds. Kips and ksi, kips and ksi. So, if you got your area in inches squared, and you put in kips here, you're going to end up with KSI here, as long as you're using inch squared. Right? Which is what we got up here. So you'll see in the book and everything else there, there'll be those shortcuts. Looks like shortcuts. It is shortcut, but it can be confusing at first. Alright, I'm going to and I'll get out of this one and tell you that we're going to, in our heads, uh, this is a Tennis Olsen uh, grip. Tennis Olsen, it makes uh, 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 testing machines that pull or push and twist. And so this one was for wood. And so they've got a wood specimen in here. And you'll see that it's got curved here and curved here, curved down the other direction. And the reason for that is, is it they want this to fail in this region right in here. And you got some problems right here when it comes out of the grip. So if you have it curved, it will it, the, it's figured out how you can make sure that it actually breaks in here. So they just take a hole out on each end and hydraulically pull on it and uh, until it breaks. Okay. Well, and what we do, and I'm going to illustrate this in a little bit different fashion, is if, if you want to think of it this way, I don't think I can write on top of it. That's okay. You could put two dots on this. There. Three inches apart. Apply a load. Measure it again. Well, we have things that are called extensometers that you just clip on. Extension extensometers. They're a transducer. They change displacement into uh, a voltage so you can record it. 
So we know how much load and we know how much it's 